So let's write this simple, simple query. So I want to return a faculty such that there does not exist what? Such that there does not exist a transcript tuple. And I'm going to call this S because I basically want to um, check a student from the transcript tuple. Okay. Such that there does not exist okay, so now if you haven't if you haven't written like the outline that I did here, like this one, you will start to doubt yourself whether you should have equal or not equal. Um, so I want to find I have a student S. I'm looking at transcript tuple for the student ID and a faculty F. So now I'm in a innermost uh, thing. I need to check that that F has taught a class to S. But to be able to check that, I need transcript and classes because classes is what I have for uh, instructor ID. So I have the first thing I do, I have to check for the join condition. So I'm going to say that p dot course ID is equal to c dot course ID and p dot semester is equal to c dot semester and t dot year is equal to c dot year and t dot section is equal to c dot section. Because this is all I need to do to join these two tables, that they are for the same class, right? Not the course ID, the same class. And C dot instructor ID is equal to F dot ID. So the, uh, the course is for that faculty. And T dot student ID is equal to S dot student ID. So this is what it takes. This is a for all query. Yes? Why is it um, at the very top where we have the where and how these are mm -hmm. Why is it compared to S? So I just called it S because I only care about the student ID. Okay. Um, you can call it anything you want. But you know, you need, if I was just saying who taught all the classes, I would have used student, right? But since I'm looking at students who taught, who, who took a class, then I'm using transcript. But you could have called it anything you want. Um, or you could have called it maybe TS, maybe that's better, because you're only interested in for a student. Nope. Like this. So now, obviously, this is a uh, complex query, right? So if you write something like this, you see there is kind of no join until you have these two separate things, right? So basically, for every single faculty tuple and every single transcript tuple, you are constructing this inner query, which is going to be very inefficient, okay? So, um, but we think it's correct. We can test it and see. Uh, I'm going to write this in a separate I'm going to write this in a separate file so that I can test it. Okay, so um, right. After all this effort, it returns nothing. Um, but I watch that it is correct. Um, but if you wanted, you could have uh, tried it. So let's see. It, it will take too long to uh, try to test this. Um, all right. It is kind of an edge case. But I want to use this to show you 
that you can write the same query a little differently. Um, I cannot illustrate to you with actual tuples, but do you really need this level of complexity? Sometimes, you know, when I, when I used to be able to write this query, I was excited, but later on I started thinking, do I really need this level of complexity to write this query, right? So this is, this is the thing that I want you to notice, that logically this is fine, but it is creating this multiple nestings and it's really complex. Let's try to write this in a slightly different way. Instead of writing it like this, find faculty such that number of distinct students who took classes from them is the same as number of students who took classes. Would this also work? All right, let's write that one. That's probably going to be easier. So, faculty F transcript T classes C. Now I'm going to do some cut and paste, obviously. Um, So, so I join with T and C and C and F, okay, group by F.ID and F.name, having count star, no, count distinct as T.studentID is equal to number of students there are. So select count distinct student ID from transcript. Now if I did my uh, job this should return nothing also. Let's hope for that. All right so that's that is not proof that they are correct, but, but uh, you can uh, try with different tuples and see. Okay, so this is just my basic, uh, you know, five-minute introduction. <laughs> that you can think of the same query in different ways. You can have it with logic not exist, but you have tools in your arsenal. Counting is so powerful. You can count things. You can count and compare the counts of different things. You can do a left join to see if something doesn't join with it at all. And those are all technically much more efficient queries because you are not doing these correlated subqueries. And you know, the one subquery that it has is a very simple one, right? Basically, this is a single count. This is a scalar query. So it is very, very uh, much cheaper query than the other one. So at every point, you have to think about what are the right queries to write. And then think about different ways of writing the same expression. So this is all that we are going to do for select for now, but we are going to come back to it. Do you have any questions? OK, so we are going to now go into slightly different territory, and then we are going to come back. But everything that we do now is going to build on the same syntax. So these were all queries. In fact, when I teach databases, I uh, basically become incapable of saying question. Because I can, not everything becomes a query. But it, not everything in a database is a query, right? So a query is returning tuples. But you also need statements that change the data. So these are called the data manipulation uh, statements. They are called DML. So we have seen a bunch of things. So one of the things that we have seen was uh, create table. You give it a na table name and then list the attributes. I 
I have done this millions of times this Saturday when I was trying to uh, clean the data. Um, so you can create a table, you can drop a table. When you drop a table, it drops everything inside the table as well as the de table definition. You can alter a table by uh, renaming it to a different name. Not, not after you drop it. You can alter a table to uh, add columns. Things of that sort. Drop columns, rename columns, and there's a whole bunch of things. Um, once you have a table, you can also insert into that table So if I have a statement that says insert into table, what you have is basically one value for every attribute, right? So if I had, let's say, so let's try and see if these are actually correct syntax. Normally I'm not very good at this, but I have done this so many times this weekend that it may actually work. Yes, all right. Um, so T1 has three attributes. And they, they are defined in this order, ID name and email, right? So basically, if I were to specify values, I need to specify them in, um, in the same order as that they are. If I wanted to actually insert only to some of the attributes, you have to describe what those attributes are. So instead of saying this, you can say into T1, but only to name and email. Insert values. These. So in this case, whatever attributes you have not defined are going to assume to have null value. So um, if the ID does not allow null value, we will see what happens in a second. Yes. So what gives the feedback insert zero one? What does that indicate? Uh, <laughs> so it says it's inserted uh, one uh, column, one uh, tuple, and then I'm not sure what zero is. I think zero means that it did not give any errors. We can try and see what happens. So let's say. This is a very good question because I really don't know. <laughs> Let's try and create the, this attribute, this one. So this one cannot be null. Okay. And then we add the ta table this, right? So now if I wanted to insert into name and email, it's going to require ID to be null, but ID cannot be null. So um, it did not say anything. So I don't know what the zero is. It's a good question to look it up. I don't know. Um, interesting. Um, also that this is an older version of PSQL. So different ones will give you this different output. So um, let's try and see one more thing. Okay, let's for a fact, let's try the same thing here. I'm gonna get rid of this, and I'm going to add email marker 100. Okay. It does give you the same error. I don't, I don't really know what that means. Yes? Oh, zero? Uh, yeah, zero stands for the object identifier, but... That tells you how many object identifiers you've created? Yes, but uh, with the newer PSQL version, um, they actually stop, uh, they stop uh, adding object identifiers unless you specify, so it doesn't... Okay. Did you all hear that? Yeah. All right. 
Thank you. I just want to look up some of the stuff. We're going to talk about some of the object relational stuff later on. Um, okay, so this is the insert statement, right? So you have insert into something and value something. So the top remains the same, but the bottom can be any uh, query that you want. So you can actually take a query. So for example, select um, So I have students, you have name, email address. So I want to insert into T1 all the results from ID, email, name, and email from my students table. So this is basically telling me from the students table, find all ID, name, and email, and then insert into this new table. You can actually give a statement, like for example, you only want to return those where GPA, or let's say, who are graduating, year is equal to 2015, or 2016, and insert them into T1, because there is no such student, if you wanted to do this. There's nobody in the... All right, so now I have to see what the year is. All right, so 2018, let's say. So you can do this, all right? So, um, and if you wanted to only return that by name and email, then you could have just written the same thing, but instead you would have written something like this. So you would have written into name and email, return this query, so let's say um, return all the name and email of students who have year 2020. But of course, this is going to fail because we created ID to be not null, so I cannot make it null. But the syntax is what we care about right now. So this is the insert statement. Insert a single tuple specifying the values or insert multiple ones. In fact, there is a cool thing that you can do um, in um, Postgres, but not in every single database, you can create a table from a query. So you can say, create table T1 as select na ID, name, and email from students where year is equal to uh, 2019. Okay? So now this is the two things, right? It created this table with the schema of these three attributes, whatever they were, it is, and then it populated it with the values. So T1 has the same exact uh, schema as students for those three attributes, and the contents are basically whatever that query returns. Okay. It's actually extremely convenient when you are uh, doing lots and lots of data cleaning. So you can do the same thing like this. So, so you can say, create table T1 as, like this. Okay. Then you can uh, insert into a table, and you can delete tuples from a table. This is where things get a little bit more interesting. So this was insert. Right. Now we are going to do delete. So you're going to say delete from table all the tuples where some condition is true. Okay. But now because of the way this is written, the, the conditions can only apply to the table. You cannot, you cannot insert, update, delete from multiple tables in a single statement. You can insert into one table, you can delete from one table, you can update one table. Okay? This is the most common syntax error that I see. So I will tell it now, but it's, you know, we will correct it again and again. So, for example, um, let's drop to table T1. And then I'm going to create table T1 as select star from student.
students. Okay. So let's say that I want to delete all the tuples from here where GPA is not. Okay. Or that anybody who has graduated, let's say, you know, but we don't have any. So you can say delete from uh, students where year is less than or equal to 2016. Okay. As you know, this happens exactly as soon as you graduate, the RPI will delete you from this table and search into alumni, and then your emailing starts. You will see. Um, so year is an attribute in uh, this. Yeah, this we should do this T1. Okay. I'm doing this because I don't want to mess up my tables. Okay. It deleted nothing because there is no uh, student that said spy this, but if I do this, it will delete three tuples. So you can see that I only have three tuples now. Okay. Well, let's do something slightly different. Okay. Suppose I want to delete all students who have taken no classes, right? So uh, delete students who have taken no classes. No classes, you're dead to me. Okay. Um, so I cannot say delete from T1. Okay. I'm just using T1 for now and transcript, right? This does not make any sense because you are not deleting from transcript, right? You are deleting from T1. So you can only have what relation you are deleting from here is. But your condition has to refer to transcript, right? Yes? Okay. So, well, you can say something like T1.id is not in select student ID from script right so anytime you have to refer to another relation in your conditions because your condition has to do with another table it has to be a sub expression it could be correlated or uncorrelated depending on what is possible uncorrelated is always more efficient okay and it deleted one student Um, which was, I guess, the last one, Katie, because Katie has not. I mean, you could have written the same thing using correlated subquery, which would be the same, except probably a little bit inefficient. Something like this. So, <laughs> so that should work exactly the same way, except this one is now correlated. Okay, so be very careful. You can only delete insert from a single relation. Everything else has to be a sub-expression. This is also true for update. Okay, so the update statement is update table set attributes to values where for a subset of tuples satisfying the condition here. Okay. So this is kind of the basic uh, way. Again, you can update only a single table. So for example, I, I can say update T1 set GPA is equal to null. Now I'm going to say equal to null because I'm setting it to that value. If I'm checking if it is equal to null, I have to use is. Uh, where, for example, uh, 
student ID is not in, select like this. All right. So if there is no such student, the, G, the no class, their GPA should be null. Since I already deleted the uh, KD, it's not possible. Let's recreate it. And then let's write the same. So now it actually updated only a single token. So suppose I add a column here, which is total number of credits. So um, alter table T1 at uh, total. Do we have total credits here? No. Credits as int. Okay. So now I want to set these total credits, which currently is uh, null because I don't have any value. Now I want to set this value to be the total credits that student took as before, right? So I would have to write something like update t1, set total credits to some big query here where you can have a statement, maybe you wanted to do it for only those people who, you know, um, have a year certain condition. If you don't have a rare condition, then it's going to be everybody, right? And the total credits is something I just wrote the whole query. There was some crazy query that I wrote here, right? So let's use this query. Man, this was long. So now let's write this query. But I really don't need to do all of this. Okay. All I need to find is the number of credits for this student, T1, where um, T1.id, and I don't need to group by because I have a single query. You know, I write crazy queries. Let's put that in here. So, let's write, let's look at this. All right, so I'm telling that update table T1, set the total credits field to the total credits. Bless you. For the student, so the ID of the student is the T1 here, such that there does not exist a course from before that they have taken for the same. Okay, such that T2.course ID is T.course ID, student ID is T1 ID, and the year and semester is the last. It doesn't like when I have so much stuff here. So I need to write this. Let's go, I forgot how to do that. Um, all right, fine. All right, so I do have a, uh, let's see what we have. Total credits, I think I'm missing a parenthesis here. Yep. This is why we use Emacs. All right, now it has updated the total credits for everybody. These people, they got uh, nothing because I returned no tuples for them, right? So, so the sum returned null value. If you want it to be zero, right, you needed to change so that your query actually returns zero when there is none, right? So um, how do I do that? 
So then you can use like a min function. You can return either zero or the number, right? And the null should not really ever be correct. So you can say something like, there is, there is min and max, but min and max are for aggregation in SQL. I believe the correct thing is the, uh, the least, you know, greatest of zero or this huge thing. Let's see if that works. Okay, now it actually returns zero when there is none, right? So you can choose whichever version you want, whether you want it null or not. So if you did not have any state, any conditions, so if you had, for example, update uh, t1, set uh, credits to uh, null, this will uh, update the tuple for every single person, right? So basically, or you can say, GPA equal to null. Oh, let's just do GPA equals 4.0. So if you don't have a condition, then it will do it for every single person. If you have a condition, let's do two, where it's very bad, where um, major is equal to EHYS, right? And the same thing is true for delete. So delete from T1 will do what? It will delete every single tuple in T1. So what is the difference between delete and drop? Delete removes the tuples, right? But use the table definition, but a drop will completely remove the table, right? So uh, drop table T1 will completely remove the table, so you, can, you don't have such a table, okay? So, any questions? Insert, update, delete? Question? Okay. So um, in the remaining uh, 20 minutes, we are going to walk into a slightly different world, okay? So now that you have seen there is statements that change the data, now we are going to learn about rules about how you can change the data. And this is going to be a very important part. There are basically two reasons why you actually use a database management system. The first one is that you can write complex queries and they are very efficiently uh, implemented. The second one is that you can write statements that change the data, and there are some guarantees about what can or cannot happen. So this is the part that uh, we will basically come back to many times. But the first thing that we will talk about is the notion of a trans transaction. Okay. And it is very long to write transaction and I've already been burnt by functional dependency, very often I'm just going to write X act, which just means transaction, okay? First databases that were ever implemented were transactional databases. They were able to do many changes quickly, and that's why they were much more popular, so they became the, uh, the de facto databases. So a transaction is basically anything that touches the data, but often we don't care uh, about, so if you have a database and all you do is query that database, then we are perfectly fine, right? And in fact, often uh, different companies will separate their data as this is the part of the data that I query, this is the part of the data that changes, right? And they have totally different ways of uh, storing them and accessing them. For example, you can imagine for like Amazon, right? Amazon has like this huge part which is basically all about you quickly searching something and finding if it's being sold by them, right? So that's the query part. And then there's a whole other part is basically when you're buying things, right? And when you're buying things, you have to really worry about keeping track of the inventory, making sure your credit card account is recorded, and that within 
in the next, let's say, less than a second, you get a response because otherwise you walk and buy from somewhere else, right? The attention span. So uh, all of that is basically the stuff we care about. So transactions, generally, we care about transactions if you are changing data, okay? So transaction is basically, think about any sequence of operations that change data. But of course, when you're changing data, you may also be accessing other data. And the point is that the transaction is not a single query. It's not a single statement. A single insert may not be your transaction. Your transaction may involve multiple steps. So uh, for example, suppose you are buying something from Amazon, right? You are going to basically do multiple things. You are going to first um, add one or yeah, add one to um, purchases table probably. Then you're going to subtract one from inventory. Um, plus, a very important part of this transaction is that you're also going to do something with the credit card that you provided, right? So uh, uh, make sure that your credit card is charged. Charge credit card. Much more important than the other obviously, right? So this is, for example, a uh, e-purchase of any kind. And um, often the credit card is a separate database, so you actually have a distributed transaction that goes and comes back. But let's for now assume that they are all in the same database. So these three things together is a uh, transaction, right? And they are together a transaction Important thing is that you should not succeed in one and not the other, right? So basically, I want all these three steps to succeed before I can declare that you have purchased the site, right? And then ship you one copy. So there are many ways this would be bad, right? If actually I uh, added one to purchases, subtracted one from inventory, and then created a, you know, um, created a kind of... Um, a um, request to ship it from the shipping center, but did not charge your credit card, this is bad for Amazon, right? Or that if you actually, uh, uh, you know, added one to purchases and, um, or if you subtracted one and charged your credit card, but did not record that you uh, had purchased this, then that's bad for you, right? So the point is that these three things are a unit. So you can either do all of them or none of them. So this is kind of one of the most important part of a transaction. It is called an atomicity. So a transaction has to be atomic. In the sense that um, basically either everything will succeed or not, right? So atomicity is like one of the most important parts of databases. So either everything in your transaction succeeds, or if any one of them fails, then you basically remove, you undo everything that you have done and remove, and it has left no effect, right? So, so either all parts of the transaction succeeds, or transaction does not change the database at all. So this is kind of the, the semantics that we are going after. We want to make sure that every single transaction that I write is either atomic, is, is atomic and nothing else is allowed, okay? So whenever a transaction succeeds and everything goes well, then you complete the transaction and that's called a commit. And if at any point in your transaction you decided that the transaction is not succeeding, 
then the transaction is rolled back. So it's called a rollback or abort. Okay. Now, when you're writing programs, there are certain parts in your program you can decide that you must, in fact, roll back the transaction. Or it may roll back on its own because of something that happened that you realize that you cannot complete it. So this happened just a moment ago when we were trying to insert into a table that was a null value that could not be null, so I could not insert, and then it rolled back. It gave me an error, plus it did not change the table at all, right? So, um, so basically, it can happen because you wrote it, or it can happen because um, something went wrong. But generally speaking, you can think of a um, transaction has a begin statement. You generally don't have to say begin transaction because it has, you know, begin just generally is enough. And then you can have multiple statements. And then either a commit or a rollback. So this is not something we have written yet. And I, this is what I don't want you to do, of course, in the homework. But in the next homework, you are going to be writing transactions. So you know, all the statements we have learned, you should be uh, putting them in a transaction block so that within this block, either everything will succeed or not, right? But if you have, let's say, three things, but the second thing failed because of some other reason, for example, the null value, you violated a constraint, it will not even reach this commit, and it will actually roll back from that point up, right? So at any point, if something fails, it rolls back. The reason why we are talking about this is that a lot of the insert, update, delete statements, they all operate within a block of transaction, right? So since we have not defined explicit block, all the operations that we see actually execute within their own transaction. Every statement is its own transaction. So let's say I had this uh, statement. Um, insert into T1. Select star from students. OK. So let's say this statement is going to insert four tuples. Inserting these four tuples is a transaction to together. So let's say one of the tuples have a null value that it should not be. So that means that I'm going to insert three tuples or no tuples. Right? So let's write this down. Okay. Let's just do a very simple example so that it's not so abstract. So let's say I am going to create a table T2 where ID is not null. And I'm going to create table T1, which has an ID, but it doesn't really care. So I can insert into T1 values 1. Two and null, right? Okay. And if I were to write, okay, now insert everything, um, insert into T two, select star from T one. Well, the problem is that T1 has three tuples, but the third tuple is actually going to violate this constraint called uh, not null. So it has two options, right? Insert tuple one and two and not the third one. But that would not be atomic because these three insertions are supposed to be atomic. So let's see what happens. OK. So. The null value in the ID violates it, failing row contains null. And as a result, nothing is inserted because the whole transaction is failed. OK. 
Okay? This is what I mean by atomicity. So this is just at the statement level, but it's going to extend to all the others. Now, this is important because your, state, your SQL statements may cause, may uh, violate many different constraints that we can define. And we have seen some of them, but we are going to go into more detail. So there are many constraints. Whenever you insert into a table, all the table constraints are checked, right? So if an insert violates any constraint at all, all the inserts are rejected. Then the whole thing is rolled back. So, um, so all inserts and updates cause a check of table constraints. So what kinds of table constraints do we have? Tell me what are my table constraints. So I have already told you about not now, right? Some, some attributes may not be now. Do we know any other constraint on the table level? What is the thing that I tortured you with in the first beginning of class? Yeah. Domain of value, invalid domain. Okay. What is the other thing that I really tortured you with? Why did we have to do all the functional dependencies? Primary keys, right? So primary keys meaning duplicate values will actually cause an error. The other thing that may cause an error is uh, you can also define certain attributes as unique. So that may cause an error. You can also define a check statement that checks whether the certain, uh, att certain values are allowed. So for example, you can say create table T1 id is int, check that id is greater than or equal to uh, uh, 20. Or the RPI one was 66, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, something like this, right? I don't know why, but that's what it is. Okay? So you can actually create additional constraints for a specific attribute. The important thing is that all of these, are, all of these um, values are checked every time you try to insert an update a toggle in the table. <coughs> All right. What else is checked? Any other uh, constraints we have seen? How about the foreign key? Right? So foreign key is the most challenging one. So this is called referencing. Okay. So for example, if I were to define that T1 is the primary key, and then I define If I define something as a foreign key, this is telling me that the one that ID values must exist in that table, right? So can P1 be not? Is there enough no constraint? So the point is that in P1, in T2, you can have null values for this value. But if there is a value, it must exist, okay? Oh. I don't think you're supposed to say foreign key if it's just in place. Okay? So for example, I can insert into T1 
All right, fine. Okay. So, um, T1 has this value, so I can now insert into T2, for example, values like 1 and null, which is allowed. It is allowed that I can reference an existing value, like 111. But what is not allowed is to put some value that is not actually in the database, right? Oh, this is a different constant. Okay? Because now it's telling me that 4.4 is not actually present in T1. So the foreign key constraint is that every value that you put must exist in the other table. But the not null is a separate constraint. You can say it could be null or it could not be null separately. But if it does have a value, it must exist there. Okay. So we're going to stop here. And then on uh, Thursday, we are going to um, actually try to find a way to uh, define what happens in these cases. So there may or may not be a quiz. I haven't decided yet. But uh, we'll pick up from here. <laughs>